Hey everyone, welcome back to episode 10 of Zero to CSWP. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at mechanical and advanced mates inside of SOLIDWORKS. Now, in the last episode, I mentioned how we'd be looking at some evaluation tools in this episode, but we're going to save that to the next episode where we also look at assembly modeling practices. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be reminded of any future videos. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into SOLIDWORKS. So let's start with the parts with the suffix of B to start the assembly. We can create a new assembly, and first we can import the part listed B1. Then let's import the part B2. First, let's add a simple cone centric mate between the hole of B1 and the shorter shaft of B2. Then let's say we want B2 to be in between the sides of B1 we can use the width mate. The width requires four selections, two for the width and two for the tab. The mate constrains the tab between two faces or planes. The width box selection should be the faces that are on the outside, whereas the tab should be on the inside. So, since the shaft is shorter, it will be the tab, and the outside walls of B1 will be the width. Once these are selected, we have a few more options for our mate regarding how we want the tab to be positioned relative to the width selections. We can select centered, free, dimension, or percent. The centered selection will center the tab relative to the width. Free will allow us to drag the tab between the width selections, and the dimension and percentage let us define the tab's position relative to the width based on a percentage or dimension away from a width selection. For most mates, you'll end up using the centered or free option. We can apply these two same mates and add another B1 part in. The next mate we can look at is the limit angle mate, which lets us limit the angle of two planar faces between a range of values. We can select these faces of the two B1 parts in our assembly. We can select our upper and lower bounds. In this case, let's select a range of 20 to 40 degrees. Then the angle between the two faces is limited to between 20 and 40 degrees. The limit mate does the same thing with distances, so I won't bother covering it. Next, let's look at the profile center. This mate makes two profiles centered on each other. The profiles can be either circular, rectangular, or an n-sided regular polygon, for example, a hexagon. Let's add in part B3 to show a profile center between a circular and rectangular face. We can select this face of B1 and this face of B3, selecting the profile center mate, and there we can see that these two profiles are now centered on each other. If we want a distance between the two faces, we can add that in with this option. And if we want our circular profile to not be able to rotate, we can select this option. We don't want our part to rotate, so we will select this option. Next, let's add in part B4 to show the symmetry mate. First, let's make this part's profile center to the other end of B3 without locking rotation. The symmetry mate is pretty simple and self-explanatory. It makes two similar entities symmetric about a plane or planar face. You can use lots of entities such as points, lines, planes, spheres or cylinders of equal radii, and axes or sketch lines. Just to showcase this mate, let's make the two angled faces of B4 symmetric to an assembly plane. We can select the symmetric mate and select the reference plane to be the assembly right plane, and then select the two drafted faces as the selections. We can now see the part is symmetric across this plane, leaving only one axis of rotation for our part. Looking at our next mate, the path mate, we can delete this symmetric mate as they would interfere. Before we look at our path mate, let's add another joint using the B1 and B2 parts so that our arm can have more degrees of freedom. First, I will delete the mates associated with B4 as I will still use it once the joint is made. Then I can just repeat all of the mates I made previously to make the joint, add a B3 part to the end, and then remate the B4 part, this time locking the rotation.
For Pathmate, we need a sketch. Let's make a sketch in the assembly on a reference plane, which is offset from one of the assembly planes. Then let's draw a sketch using a line and arc and define it with some dimensions. Then we can select a path mate. The path selection will be our sketch. And we can select our vertex selection as this point of B4. The benefit of a path mate relative to a coincident mate is there is much more control of the point on the path relative to a coincident mate where there is no control at all. You can control the distance or percentage along a path as well the pitch, yaw, and roll of the selection. I won't go into these too deep here, as in an exam situation, it will simply give you the numbers for each selection box. You won't really have to think about it. Before we get into our next assembly, let's take a look at the universal joint mate. The assembly we have here with B1 and B2 is a universal joint, where the rotation of one component about its axes causes rotation of another component. Instead of having all the mate definitions we have here, we can just use the universal joint mate. A quick thing to note is since the bottom B1 part is fixed, it cannot be in the setup a universal mate since it cannot move. So let's change how this assembly is set up real quick to show this mate. We can float the bottom B1 part and fix this B3 part. This profile center mate, we need to change to have the profiles unlocked so that the top B2 part on the bottom joint can rotate. Then we can make the bottom face of B1 coincident to the assembly plane it is sitting on. This might have been a bit confusing, but all we wanted to do is allow fixed rotation for both B1 parts on the bottom joint. Now if we want to add a universal joint mate between these two, we can select the cylindrical sections of each part. We can see that a rotation of one component causes rotation of another. It is important to reiterate, doing this with the concentric and width mates using the B2 part accomplishes the same outcome, but using one mate for something is much easier than using four, especially when an assembly becomes very large and starts taking a lot of time to run on your computer. There, you would want to use as little mates as possible. As for the relevance of this mate on the exam, I would not expect the universal joint mate to show up, but like everything else, but like almost everything else, it is very useful to know how it works. Next, let's open the C assembly. With this assembly, we'll be looking at the rest of the mates, excluding the hinge mate, as it is kind of redundant for this exam. Parts won't look this bad on the exam itself. Remember, this is just to showcase all the mates, and this part really doesn't make sense if you're going to make anything. Let's start with a cam mate. A cam follower mate is much like a tangent or coincident mate. It allows you to mate a cylinder, planar face, or point to a series of tangent extruded faces such as you would find on a cam. The main benefit of this is that the mate basically serves as a combination of a coincident and tangent mate that can act on multiple tangent faces. We have three examples here at the front of the assembly for the cam mate, for a cylinder, a planar surface, and a point. Let's make a cam follower mate for all three, with the cam path being the outside face of the cam, and the follower either being the face, point, or 
cylinder of the part. We can see with each of these, rotating the cam causes the weird linear motion of the follower following the shape of the cam, much like how a tangent or coincident nape would work. The cam in this situation is a combination of an arc and a spline. If we were to use a regular tangent mate, if we were to make a regular tangent or coincident mate, it would not work as these two faces are separate. Next, let's look at the slot mate. This mate is quite simple. It lets us make a cylindrical selection inside of a slot selection. Let's make this cam follower inside this slot. In the slot selection, we can select the slot here, and for the other selection, we can select the cylindrical section of the follower part. Then we have a few controls of the cylindrical position relative to the slot, much like a width mate, centering it, making it free, or a distance or percentage along the slot. Let's just leave it free. Now we can look at the gear mate. This lets us control the rotation of one cylindrical selection based on another cylindrical rotation, based on a gear ratio. On the back of our assembly, we have five parts. Two cylinders representing gears, one extrusion representing the rack pinion, and two more regular extrusions just representing extrusions. We will be using these to show the gear, rack pinion, linear coupler, and screw mates. One more thing to note before we get into this is you don't actually need a real gear to make a gear mate. They do not rely on the gear teeth, but rather just the related rotations to other rotations or linear motion through the gear ratio we assign. This will make sense in just a few seconds. Let's select the gear mate and select R2 gears. By selecting the outside cylindrical portion, SolidWorks will automatically assign a gear ratio based on the relative sizes of the cylindrical sections. But if you need to change it, then just simply edit it in the text box. You can also reverse the direction of one gear with the reverse checkbox. In this case, the ratio is the right ratio we want, so we won't be changing it. The rack pinion mate is very similar. It lets us relate movement about an axis to linear motion, much like a pinion and rack gear would do. Remember that a pinion is just a regular circular gear, but used with a rack. In this case, we have one cylindrical or circular selection and one planar or line selection. We can select our rack gear below this gear and the gear itself. We can again select the specifications for movement for the rack gear based on revolutions and reverse if need be. Now we have the linear coupler mates. This relates linear motion of two components based on their movement and ratio between them. This is seen in pulley systems or things like telescoping arms. We're going to have a mate between the gear rack and the bottom extrusion. We can select the linear coupler mate and a few selections show up. The entities to mate lets us select the parts or more specifically the faces we want to mate. So we will select the two faces at the ends of our extrusions. They will move normal to the planar surface of the face. We can select the ratio between the linear motion of the two entities to be one to two inches. Every one inch the rack moves, the other extrusion will move two inches. And of course, we can reverse this as well. Then the reference component allows us to specify the reference component for the first mate component. We won't need to do this as this is a little more complex in creating linear coupler mates. Usually you can leave it blank and it will all be fine. The motion is with respect to the assembly origin. This might be a little confusing, but try it out for yourself and you'll see what I mean. Lastly, the screw mate lets us relate rotational motion to linear motion along the axes of rotational motion. This represents things like ball screws. We can relate the motion of a gear to this extrusion along the gear's axis of rotation. That is to say, however much this gear moves, the extrusion will either come closer or farther away from the gear. Like the other mates, we can relate the motion of the two through a ratio of distance to rotation and reverse if necessary. We're not going to be looking at the hinge mate in this video simply because it acts as a coincentric and coincident mate combined, and covering this would be a bit redundant. Now that we have all of the mates inside SolidWorks covered, excluding the hinge, 
In the next episode, we're going to get deeper into assembly practices and evaluation. We now have the building blocks to make any assembly we want. Thanks for watching episode 10 of Zero to CSWP. I really hope you learned something, and at this point you should know all of the mates inside of SOLIDWORKS. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at how to evaluate your parts, and as well, some assembly modeling practices. After that, we'll have the practice episode for segment 3 of the CSWP exam, and we'll be done with Zero to CSWP series. At that point, you'll be able to take the CSWP exam and hopefully pass. So stay tuned for the next two episodes, and I'll see you then.